Okay, so today we're going to be looking at 4.6 of the GCSE AQA. And specifically, we're looking at tissues and organs in plants. Now, normally when you think about an organ, you're thinking about the kidney or the liver, and you'd rarely think about an organ in a plant. But if we remember what the definitions are, a tissue is a group of cells working together to do, perform a particular function. An organ is a group of tissues working together to perform a function. So, <clears throat> if we think about it, the leaf is actually an organ. So that must mean that it's made up of various tissues. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar from Key Stage 3 with this arrangement of the leaf. And you can actually see it in the textbook on page 63. This is the diagram that you're probably more used to seeing. So, here's my representation of it, and here's a model of it. Now they all look different and that pushes the point that you should be using different textbooks, different images because a diagram isn't a correct visual representation, it's a working model on a piece of paper. So we're looking today at the various tissues. Now you need to know which tissue is which, the name of them. You need to know what it does and how its structure is related to its function. So if we look at this as the organ. This is the leaf. If we've cut a leaf, if this was the leaf, it's thin, we've cut it this way and we're looking that way. So first of all we've got its waxy upper epidermis. Now an epidermis is just basically a layer and it's like a waterproof layer. When you feel a leaf you know that the top of it is a little bit waxy and the whole point of that is so that it doesn't lose any water from the top of the leaf. Now that waxy layer is actually made by this upper epidermis. These upper epidermis are a thin layer of transparent cells. They need to be transparent because light needs to pass through them to the main photosynthetic layer. So this is our upper epidermis. They're made of epidermal, epidermal cells. And so that's a tissue. The next layer these are what we commonly, whenever we've drawn a plant cell in the past with chloroplasts and a vacuole and a nucleus, these are the cells that we're drawing. And the tissue is called the palisade mesophyll layer. And so clearly they contain a lot of chloroplasts and that is how they are adapted to their function of absorbing light energy and changing it to chemical energy. Remembering, humans can't do that. We rely on plants because they're the only things that can take light and change it into a banana. They can take light and change it into a tomato. We can't. So we've got our palisade mesophyll layer. The next layer we've got is the spongy mesophyll layer. Now you'll notice that these cells are irregular in shape. The reason why they're irregular is because it allows gases to pass through to these cells and also because it allows gases to move out from the cell out of this hole here. If you can just think which gas would be moving in and which gas would be moving out. Okay, so we mentioned the irregular shape and we mentioned the fact that gases can pass through and of course it would be carbon dioxide moving through to the palisade cells for photosynthesis and oxygen diffusing out. The other things uh, that mesophils ha mesophil cells have to help them do their function is they do have some chloroplasts in there and the reason why is because if light shines through between cells or if it just passes through the palisade cells it will still land on a photosynthetic cell that can mop up the light and use it for photosynthesis. The other layer that we're looking at is this lower epidermis and these are all, again it's a tissue, they're all the same cells working together but they're punctuated with these cells here. These cells are called uh, guard cells and the hole that they produce is called the stomata. Now guard cells are like those, I want you to think of them as those long 
stretchy balloons that you can get that, they, that magicians twist into funny shapes. When you first blow one of those balloons up and you don't put too much air into it, it's a long straight balloon. When you continue to blow, the balloon takes on a curved shape. And that's exactly what happens with these guard cells. As they absorb more water, they become more turgid and they bend. And that bending opens up the stomata so that there's then a hole. And when there's less water, the cells become flaccid and they close. And this is the plant's way of controlling the water loss. So you'll remember from year seven that one of the tissues in a plant that we talk a lot about is the xylem. And if I just draw very quickly my diagram that I always draw of a plant, uh, you'll remember that a xylem carries water and dissolved mineral, mineral ions from the root to the leaf. Now we have to use the word mineral ions because if we just use the word minerals, if you think magnesium, if you write that in an exam for a, for a mineral ion, magnesium is a metal. You don't see metals being pulled up with water through the plant to the leaf. But a magnesium ion is something that's soluble in water. So we need to always make sure that we write mineral ions down. So let's just have a little look at what the cross section of the xylem in the root would look like. So I've cut my thin root, I've cut it this way, and I'm looking that way. So it's gonna be circular, and it interestingly takes on this shape. Well, that's convenient because straight away we can remember, it looks like an X xylem. Now the phloem is a tube that carries uh, sucrose dissolved in water from the leaf to the root and that is um, also therefore in the root system so when I draw those on I can remember the xylem looks like an X so that goes first and these bits are my phloem now you need to know that how the tissue of the xylem looks as it passes through the root and how the tissue of the phloem look, looks as it passes through the root. If we look at the phloem and the xylem as it passes through the stem, it takes on a different appearance. Now, if you remember, we said that the xylem, it's got an X, whoops, it's got the phloem, and that's in the root. If we then cut across the stem and we look that way, it takes on a different appearance. It looks a little bit like this. Now the question is, this is the xylem in the middle. Thinking about this diagram, how can you remember that this would be the xylem and this would be the phloem? And of course, most students say, the xylem's in the middle there and it's also in the middle there. And that helps you to remember if you have to label a diagram of how the xylem and the phloem appear in the stem. So now we're looking at how does the xylem and the phloem look in the actual leaf itself. So if I show you this diagram, we go back to this one. This is my leaf vein. It's vein because like your veins, it's part of the transport system in a plant. So the xylem was in the middle and it's now on the top in the leaf vein. The phloem was on the outside and it's now on the bottom. So in my mind, how I remember that is the xylem is in the middle and as it comes up and out onto the plant, it would naturally be on the top. So now we're going to look at how the structure of the xylem is composed. The xylem is a long, long tube, but it didn't start off as that. When the plant first started to grow, these were all individual cells. The cells then died. They couldn't maintain their cell walls. They couldn't maintain their cell membrane. And these end bits degenerated. Before the plant died, what it did do was it produced a substance called lignin. And it wrapped it all around the tube. Now that lignin gave 
the xylem vessel a lot of strength. Now, remember, these were individual cells, so the xylem tubes are really, really, really thin, very much like a capillary tube that we use in biology. So in actual fact, what we've got is we've got loads of these together. And that's why, again, if you cut it in this direction and look down the tube, it will look like this. Phloem is a very different tube. Yes, it carries substances like the xylem, but that's where the similarities and differences finish. The xylem is made of live tube, is made of live cells, and they line up along each other. Now, they're moving dissolved sucrose, which is dissolved in water, down from the leaf to the root. And we'll talk about the reasons why later. So if this is my tube, I want sucrose to pass from here to here, from cell to cell. Now, for that to happen, I want to remove most of the contents of my cells because a big nucleus in there, a big vacuole, is going to impede the passage of the sucrose. So what phloem cells do is they have an additional cell attached to them, and it's called a companion cell. And that companion cell basically keeps this cell alive. Now the other, because this is a fairly empty cell therefore, it's still got cytoplasm in, but because it's a fairly empty cell, um, the, the passage of sucrose can move through. But to increase that passage, what happens is the uh, end plates here behave like a sieve and they have small holes in them. So these end plates, because they behave like a sieve, we call them sieve end plates. And these gaps mean that substances can pass through with ease. So how are phloem tubes adapted to their function? The phloem cells themselves are very empty. The companion cells work with them, uh, holding all the organelles that keep the phloem cells alive. And the cell walls at the end have these gaps, which have got a lovely name called plasma desmata, that allow the passage of sucrose. In Cambridge, they might, the CIE uh, Cambridge examination, they would just ask you all about the structure of the xylem or the phloem. AQA doesn't want to know that. A grade C student will know the structure of the xylem and will know the structure of the phloem. A grade A student will be able to do, compare similarities and differences of the tubes. So let's have a look at that. We are comparing the xylem with the phloem. They're both tissues. Um, and then the other things that I can say, if I say the xylem is one thing, I have to say what the phloem is. So we've said that the xylem is lignified. It's got that extra support around the tube of cells. So I have to say, that the phloem is non-lignified. The xylem is dead, the phloem is alive. In the xylem, there are no end plates, but in the phloem, we've got sieve end plates. The xylem is a tube, the phloem is a tube, so that's a similarity. The xylem carries water and minerals, but the phloem carries dissolved sucrose. If you remember, sucrose is a disaccharide. In the xylem, the process is passive and that's because water's moving into the root hair cell by osmosis. It doesn't take any energy. But in the phloem, the process is active. In other words, it uses energy. It uses active transport to pull the sugars in into the phloem at the top of the tube. The process of moving it down the tube is passive but the process of moving those sugars into the tube is active and they both use a system called mass flow mass flow describes how things move on the basis of pressure so it's pressure at the bottom of the xylem that moves substances up and it's pressure at the top of the phloem that moves substances down now you'll see i've written both of these things in red and that's because that's extension. If you're moving on to A-level, 
then yeah, take an understanding of those. If you're struggling to just keep ahead, then just look at these things here.